All right. Well, friends, we are in this series, Infinite and Intimate, and we are exploring um, a lot of different questions of who God is, this God who is um, all-encompassing the creator and sustainer of the universe, but also this God that's intimately interested in us. And today, we turn our hearts towards the question, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus Christ, and what do we do with that question, with that reality of who Jesus is? Have you ever had somebody um, describe you? Isn't that to have somebody like, oh, we don't do that, right? Because, like, you know, I just imagine for myself, well, he looks like an athlete who's been carbo-loading for about 10 years. Like, that's how I picture someone describing me. And these different things, like, you know, you say they have blue eyes, they have dark hair, they have whatever, and, and you get described, these adjectives that describe us. Have you ever had to describe yourself? Like you're meeting someone and you're like, oh. I'll be standing in the back. I'm about six foot one, you know, dark hair. Like you try and you don't know how to explain yourself and not like throw yourself to the ground but also not sound like, you know, Adonis. So you're like somewhere in between is this reality. I think the best way I ever saw someone describe themselves was in the movie Liar Liar with Jim Carrey. Uh, I know, right? It's such a magical film, but we're not here to talk about that. Um, uh, stay on topic with me. Uh, but in that movie, Jim Carrey has beaten himself up in the bathroom because he can't lie, and he needs out of the courtroom, so he assaults himself in the bathroom again. Magical film. And he comes back into the courtroom, and he has tissue paper to staunch the flow of blood from his nostrils, and he just looks beat up. And the judge says, what happened to you? And he says, I was attacked by a madman. And he said, what did he look like? And Jim Carrey's face is just so expressive and beautiful. He's like, he's like, oh, he's about six foot two, big teeth, kind of gangly. And he looks so sad because when he described himself, he couldn't lie. And when he said it, you could just see him like, oh, that's just true. And, and it's that reality of how am I perceived? What do people see when they see me? And what do I believe of myself, Right. Well, this same question applies to Jesus in his day. There were, um, look at the, let's look at the way people describe Jesus. Um, when, when we ask people, who is Jesus? You let people say, he's a good man. You let people say, he's a liar and he's deceived the world. You let people say, he's out of his mind. You let people say, he's a prophet. There's others who will say, he is the Messiah. But the reality of this, and it's kind of an unsettling mix of descriptors that kind of paint this exciting, fearful, mysterious person of Jesus. We don't really know how to reckon what it is, and it's kind of hard to describe. But when we look at this and we put it into context of who's saying these things, we can see that these people saying these things about Jesus are people from his day. He's a good man is a quote that comes from John chapter 7, verse 12. People say he's a liar. And the, and the quote from Scripture is, no, he deceives people. Again, John 7, 12, he's out of his mind. Someone says to Jesus, you're demon-possessed. That's in John 7, 20. He's a prophet. John 7, 40, he's the Messiah. He's the Christ. John 7, 41, we see these descriptions, descriptions come out. And we need to realize these descriptions don't come from people roaming around Times Square with no real cultural context for Jesus, they are sharing the same air as Jesus, the people who said this. They are in the same space as Jesus. And so for them, they're not really sure who he is. And one of the realities for us is um, we get to go and see how Jesus would describe himself. What does Jesus say about himself. And I think this is a critical point for us to understand that Jesus uses language in John chapter 7 that allows scripture to interpret scripture. Okay? Our main text will jump out of John chapter 4 today. But John chapter 7 serves as a bit of a flashlight to illuminate the text to us. And I want to look at it with you and kind of see this is what Jesus said on the last and greatest day of the festival. Jesus stood up and in a loud voice declared, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And by this he meant the Holy Spirit, which for those who believed in him would later receive. Jesus said, let anyone who is thirsty come to me. Come to me and drink. 
And not only drink, but if they believe in me, rivers of living water would well up from within them. And I think the reality of this is, is that we get to look at this text and say, okay, Jesus is naming himself as a fountain, as a a place of living water. We, in the Reformed tradition, we say this. It's it's called ad fontes, from the source. And this is really cool. I forgot to say it in first service, so you're welcome. But um, from the source, okay? So ad fontes means this. There is but one source. And the headwaters of everything living, ad fontes, is Jesus Christ. He is the headwaters of all life. He is the place water, the water of life flows from. So we recognize in this that Jesus is naming something in John chapter 7 that will help us better understand what we're about to talk about in John chapter 4. Now, in John chapter 4, what we're going to do is we're going to see that um, the way we're going to attack this is we're going to read the end and then go back and deal with the beginning. Kind of like Saving Private Ryan, where that old man was standing at the Normandy um, battlefield, and his eyes look up and it drifts away and it goes to D-Day. You see that he survives, but you don't know who he is and those things. We are going to look at the end and then unpack it from the beginning. Here's what Jesus said in John chapter 4, or what went on in John chapter 4 at the end of this story. Many of the Samaritans in that town believed in him, Jesus, because of the woman's testimony. She said, he told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two more days. And because of his words, many more people became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you have said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. We know, not just by your words, but by his own mouth, that this man is the Savior of the world. So let's go back and listen to the full story. That's the end. It ends well. But there's this idea of the thirst that people feel for the answers to life. Who is Jesus? Why am I here? And these things. We thirst for them. And thirst is a very natural kind of part of human life, isn't it? A part of life. I found myself in first service, I drank an entire bottle of water, and I think it's Pavlov's Law. I kept talking about how thirsty I was, and I was like, I am parched. Now I feel a little bloated because I've drank too much water, right? You keep saying I thirst. It's a natural human inclination to thirst. But what we need to do is dial in on this and check out the full story. That was John chapter 4, I think 39 to 42. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about John chapter 4, 1 to about 30, okay? I'm going to talk to you about it in narrative form instead of just reading the scripture. I want to get uh, take the liberty of unpacking it with you. So Jesus is traveling to Samaria, and he's traveling through Samaria to go to Galilee, okay? So it's like saying, I went to Cadillac to get to Petoskey right? That's a way you get north. Jesus is headed north. And the reason he's headed north is because the Pharisees have decided that Jesus is baptizing more people than the apostle, than than John the Baptist, and they're not happy about it. And Jesus departs from Jerusalem and goes north into Galilee. When he gets to, when he go, when he's going through, he gets to a little town in Samaria called Sychar. And when he gets to Sychar, he sits down around noon at a well. He sends his disciples into the town about a mile away to get food. And Jesus, tired from the journey, sits down and is resting. When a woman comes up to the well in the middle of the day and begins to draw water, and Jesus says to her, can you give me a drink? Can you give me a drink? And she looks at him and she's like, yeah, we're not supposed to talk. You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. And in case you didn't get the notice, we hate each other. Why are you talking to me? Why are you talking to me? And Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God that was before you now and who was asking you for a drink, you would actually have said to me, could you give me a drink of living water? At this, the woman's ears perk up, and she says, wait a minute, you don't have anything to draw water with. Remember, it's a well. It's not like a faucet. It's not like, ear, 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 and then water comes out. Apparently, we have squeaky faucets, but... um. It's not like that. You lower a pitcher down sometimes hundreds of feet to draw water. And she says to Jesus, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep here. The well is deep here. Where can you get this living water? 
Are you greater than Jacob, our ancestor, who gave this plot of land to Joseph and dug this well himself? He drank from it and so did his livestock. And Jesus answered her, everybody who drinks from this well you and I are at will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst again. Indeed, the water I give them will become a living spring that gushes up and out of them into eternal life. The woman said to her, sir, give me this water that I won't be thirsty and I don't have to come back here again. I love her pragmatic way. She's like, okay, I would like this. I'll give you $4. Like, she's ready to make a deal. She wants the water. And Jesus says to her, go call your husband. And her, in her awesome, slightly deceitful way, says, oh, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, you're right. You've had five, four or five And the man you're living with now isn't your husband. And she says, I perceive you're a prophet. (laughs) You know, I mean, I love that line. Like, we scrub scripture, but aren't you, like, sitting there like, please, somebody walk up to the well and break the tension, right? She's like, I don't really have a husband. That's right, you have five, and the man you're living with isn't your husband. Okay, well, maybe you're a prophet. You know, it's like... I just wanted the water, and that seems pretty harsh. Like, that, that's the moment they're living in. Jesus says this, and he says to her, you are right when you say that. And then he lays out her life story to her. And since she sees that he's a prophet, she switches the narrative, and she says, look, look, my ancestors say we should worship on this mountain, but you Jews say we have to worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus kind of goes, boop, time out. Here's the deal. The day will come when you neither worship in Jerusalem or on any mountain, for salvation comes from the Jews. And according to my Father and his purposes, the day will come when you worship in spirit and truth wherever you are. Wherever you are. And the time has come and is is coming and is now come when true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth no matter where they are, no matter what they're doing. And so she goes, okay, That's a lot of information, and she just kind of tries to bookend the conversation with, well, I know the Messiah is coming, the Christ is coming, and he will explain all this to us. It's kind of the argument of, well, I hear what you're saying, but you know what? I don't know if I believe you, but uh, it's just too much. And Jesus looks at her and says, I, the one speaking to you, am the Christ. I am the Christ. At which point, she takes off for home. Like she gets on her horse and she's gone. She didn't have a horse. She took off running. She takes off running for home. She takes off running. And I think the question we have to ask in this and have to understand is who in this story, who in this story found out they were thirsty? Who in this story discovered the fact, oh, that they just had something that was missing? Because this woman, upon hearing that Jesus is the Christ, heads back to her village, back to the place where she's known as that woman. She's at the well because at noon, it's the hottest it's going to be in the day in the Middle East. It's the heat of the day, and everybody else gets water in the evening or in the early morning. Why is she there alone a mile from town, vulnerable, alone, and completely exposed to the elements? I can tell you why. She's a social pariah. She has no standing. And we have to ask the question, who in this story found out they were thirsty? And my, my, my hope is that we can ask the question, who here believed in Jesus? Who here believed in what Jesus was saying, in, Jesus, in who Jesus had declared himself to be? Who was the woman that believed? Who was the person who believed? And we can clearly say this woman at the well found out something she believed in. She got on her way back. And she didn't care about her standing in society. Imagine with me when this woman comes back to town and she's like, because she ran a mile. Oh, my gosh. I met a guy at the well. And they're like, yeah, no, obviously you did, Barbara. You always do. (laughs) You know? I mean, we always like, you know, we picture her coming in. She's like, fellow members of C-Car. I have met a prophet. You know, that's how we see it. But that's not how it is. Imagine the rolling of eyes. So you're just telling us that you met another man? Awesome. Continue to be your great self. No, 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 that's not what I'm saying. And the guy she's living with is probably like, what does this mean for me? Like, I feel a little hurt. 
but I guess I'm just number six. And, you know, like imagine the feel of it. I met this man. And then she follows it with this. And he told me everything I've ever done. And I had to be like, ooh, <laughs> that had to hurt. Like, you know, that didn't feel good. But you can't deny the fact that she's come to tell them this, and you can't get over the giant smile on her face. I met a man at the well, and he told me everything I ever did. It wasn't good news. It wasn't good news that she was told. But could it be that she was desperately thirsty for new life, and her past didn't own her because living water had filled her, and she found out her life did matter? That in Jesus Christ, her past didn't own her, and her future was held by the purposes and living water of Christ that could come flowing out of her. We recognize that she believed. We recognize that she believed. This woman who was completely isolated in society comes roaring back into it. And so we ask, who else believed? And we recognize her community believed. Remember the end of the story? Her whole community believed. Believed, and they were already outcasts. Samaritans were outcasts in the Jewish society. They were part of the northern ten tribes that worshipped and were apostate and were taken by Assyria into captivity. And then they, they, they like had kids with other cultures and did not stay faithful to God's covenant. And all of a sudden, these Samaritans are responding to God and saying, truly, This man is, by her confession and what he said, the Savior of the world. Her whole community believed. But then we ask the question, because there's those who got it, who missed it? Who missed their opportunity to encounter the risen Lord and have a moment to know Jesus? They had a moment to know Jesus. Who completely missed out on their chance to experience this living water? And I think the reality is is it's it's the religious people. Remember in the beginning, what were the Pharisees fighting about? Yeah, Jesus is baptizing more disciples than John, and they're just giving him problems about the rules. And Jesus is like, fine, I'm leaving you and I'm headed north. And he goes to give witness to God up there. They didn't need Jesus. The religious don't need Jesus. They have systems that medicate the soul. And make you think that they're okay and everything's all right. And we Christians commit this sin often. We have rules and structures and boundaries that make sure that we have social influence. That make sure we are never in want. And that make sure that we're the ones who meet the need, but we're never the ones feeling the need. And these Pharisees, these religious people had it too. Pharisees wore these ornate robes and expensive clothes, and they could walk out on a street corner, and when Bill, the Pharisee, stopped on a street corner and decided to pray because he saw a butterfly, everybody around them was like, oh, Bill, the Pharisee's praying again, and we have to stop and stand there. And they could garner influence just like that. They walked around high and holy, and they had systems and structures that were perfected to make people look good, but it was a spiritual desert where people were dying of thirst. Do we have that? Right? We have to look and say, have we missed Jesus in some way? Because these religious people completely missed who was before them. They completely missed that rivers of living water were springing up in front of them. They were not going to surrender their old structures that would call them to a place of desperate want, of dire need, and of lost influence to follow Jesus. They weren't going to give up all the prizes of this world to follow him who says, in me is rivers of living water. Just come close. Just come near and drink all you need. And not only drink what you need, but you yourself will be filled in such a way that your life will become a bubbling spring of living water. See, I think the question is, why did they miss it? How do you miss Jesus when you're that close, when you're right next to him? Why did they miss it? I think the reality is they didn't know they were thirsty. Have you ever seen someone who doesn't know they're thirsty? It's kind of a scary thing. The other, uh, not this week, but the week before, my oldest son, Joshua, he's a football player at Zealand East, and um, he, uh, a kid on the team got injured, uh, who his his he plays the other side of the ball, and so Josh played both sides of the ball the whole game. Well done, buddy. And um, 
And well, he's back there. I can't act like he's not here. Um, so he, he's out there. He plays and he worked his guts out. Kid had a great game. I had to nurse my voice for the whole weekend to be able to preach because I lose my mind. Football, it's the greatest game. But anyways, um, so he's playing. I'm like, ah, you know. And after the game, he walks off the field. And um, Erica walks up to talk to him. She comes back and says, something's not right with Josh. I'm like, well, he's 15. It happens. You know, it'll be all right. And um, <laughs> sorry, bud. And, um, and so I walk out and I kind of grab him by the neck of the jersey. I'm like, you okay? And he's like, yeah, you know, I'm fine. His eyes are a little vacant. And he's like, Ugh. and I'm like, oh. And he turns, he starts dry heaving in a trash can. I'm like, way to give it all, buddy. You know, because I, I just, I, I like football and maybe sometimes to his detriment. And, um, and so he gags over this trash can for a while. And when he stands up, he's, he's just like, huh? And it, he's pretty vacant. And I was like, oh, oh, I think he may have a concussion. Like, and I got a little more serious. Back in my day, we called it getting your bell rung. And if you got your bell rung and you went to the wrong team for the huddle, everybody's like, well, I'm sorry. You got it. And, you, you know, I mean, back in the day, medical treatment was like, stop being, you know, a pansy. And you're like, I hurt so bad everywhere. And they just wouldn't take care of you. But now there's concussion protocol. So I said, all right, I want to get you to the trainer. And we took him over to the trainer. Trainer was looking at him, and on the way there, I he got emotional. He got real emotional, which you can do after a concussion. And I put my hand on his back and said, are you okay? And I just noticed it was like sticking my hand into a pool, a pool smelling like teenage boy, but still a pool. And um, and I just was like, oh, my gosh, you're soaked. I looked at his head, and it was just running off him. I'm like, oh, I think he's dehydrated. So we started pumping Gatorade and water into him as quick as we could. And it turns out, no concussion. He was fine. And about five minutes later, he's just blah, 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 about the game. And I was like, oh, you, you were quieter when you were dehydrated. But he, he didn't know he was thirsty, right? He didn't know. He didn't know he was in danger and he was exhausted, and he was thirsty. And doesn't that sound like you and I spiritually? Are you, like me, so sick of performing the religious game, and you're exhausted and you're thirsty for that which satisfies? There is no religious structure that satisfies. There is but one font, ad fontes. There is one source that satisfies, and it's Jesus. It's Jesus that satisfies, and not knowing you're thirsty like the religious do is a dangerous thing. Because you can miss Jesus walking right in front of you because you have everything you need. You have everything you want. Your life's just so. And Jesus doesn't intend to make our lives just so. He intends to come and call us to himself in painful ways. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to unpack this as an application really in three ways. The first thing is by questions. What are you drinking? What are you drinking? Some of us from last night are like, well, that's why I'm at church today and I feel bad. I'm talking about something different, all right? What are you drinking? What you're drinking in this life is the thing that gives you life. What is your source? Is it your income? Is it your family? Is it your job? Is it your status in the community? Is it your full pantry? Is it the boat, the cars, the cottages, and all those things? What are you drinking? What are you drinking? And does it leave you thirsty? Does it leave you thirsty? When you chase all these things and it's never enough, what are you drinking? Do you, like me, find yourself unsatisfied with all that you have and seeking something that will quench your thirst? Something that will make you uh, feel a sense of purpose with all you have? See, the Apostle Paul does really well in this. The Apostle Paul was a Pharisee. He was a high-bred highbrow, noble Jew. He knew the first two-thirds of the Bible here. He could quote it to you from Genesis to the end of Malachi. He was good. He was real good. He knew Scripture. He knew the rules, and he used the system to get himself elevated. He was present when the first martyr of the church, Stephen, was stoned to death. He hunted Christians down until he met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. And his life changed. And all Paul was chasing and drinking of in religious structure felt exactly as empty as he felt. It had no purpose. It had no point. And Paul began to drink from the fountain of Christ. Paul's life became a fountain of living water, bubbling up. When you think of a bubbling fountain, who here has driven on State Street in downtown Zealand in the past two weeks? Yeah, right? The bubbling fountain. Like, can somebody call BPW and tell them there's a leak? Like, how are all of us just driving through? Because the road 
is constantly bubbling and gurgling over there. And I have my fear that it's a sinkhole and I'm going to be the sap who gets sucked into it. But that's just my fear. Like, you know, you see it. And if you've driven on State Street, if you don't, drive down to Maine and turn right on 96. And you'll see it right across from 3rd CRC. It's just bubbling out. You can't stop it because it's just a bubbling spring of water coming up out of the ground. That's what we're talking about. And Paul's life became an unstoppable bubbling spring. And Paul went on to say that every circumstance in his life, he can find joy in it. And he went from having it all to being stoned. And not the Colorado kind. Rocks thrown at him to the point of death. He was so hated in Ephesus, they stuffed him in a basket and lowered him out of the city. How bad do you have to be to leave a city in a basket? (laughs) Paul lost everything. He was shipwrecked. He was snake bit. He eventually was martyred and gave his head to the cause when Nero had him beheaded in the late 60s of AD 60. And he was joyful in prison, in ministry, and in life. He lost everything but gained the one thing that mattered. He took a drink of living water and his life would not be satisfied with any of the other luxuries. What are you drinking from? What are you drinking from? It matters what your source is. Ad fontes, ad fontes, back to the source, back to the author and the perfecter of our faith, back to the first word of creation, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gives light, life, and tells us he is a spring of living water, and we thirst. What are you drinking from? And are you tired of being thirsty? The second thing is this. We have to acknowledge our thirst. We have to acknowledge that all we have has indeed left us empty. And so my only encouragement in in this is if you're tired of being thirsty, acknowledge it and turn to that which will satisfy. You can have everything in this life and find everything lacking. And you can have nothing in this life and find Jesus altogether sufficient. The question is, will you acknowledge your thirst and turn back to the font, back to the source, back to the river of living water? Will you turn back? And finally, My favorite application, who here knows Ned Niedelander? Who knows that name? Anybody? How about Lucky Day? Yeah, you do. Anybody? Yeah. What about Dusty Bottoms? Anybody remember them? The three amigos. Remember them? Yeah, the three amigos. There's a scene from that that shows us exactly how we live. And the fact that we live in such a way that we don't share the life we've been given. Instead of me... I want to ask you something. How terrifying if that's what God showed us when we get to heaven. And he said you had the river of living water and there were people desperate for you to share what you had. And you kept it to yourself and wasted rather than shared. And you, you, you know, this holds up so well. I love when Martin Short pours the dirt into his mouth. One of my favorite scenes in all of cinema history. Because it's so shocking. When I was little I was like, oh no, not dirt. Have you ever thought about some of the theology out there in this world? Some of the knowledge of God? And people are literally satisfying their thirst with the equivalent of that. Something that neither satisfies nor sustains, but it literally chokes the life out of you. There's theology about, out there about who God is and what God does that absolutely kills life. And we sit next to these people with dirty faces and broken theology and drink for ourselves and think, well, I hope you find it. And God's going, they, they found you. They found you, you, the church, filled with the Spirit of God, rivers of living water flowing out of you at Fontes. The source has come to our lives, and indeed it should flow out. May it never be so that people in this church would feel free to no longer share their faith with the world around them. They are dying for a taste of what we have, and what we have is the reason we're alive. The purposes of Christ alive in us right here, right now, today. We get to be people who are filled with the Spirit of God, rivers of living water, answering the question, why am I here? For the glory of God and to enjoy Him forever. And how do we go about that? Through the Lord Jesus Christ, His death and His resurrection. My friends, the reality we face in this is what will we do with such a full canteen of rivers of living water to a dry and thirsty world around us? It's hot today, isn't it? Like, even as I show you that video and I take a drink, are you not like, just share a little? I'm having an object lesson. And I would invite you to remember with me that this 
sustaining life water that we've been called to share is an act of obedience. And I encourage you, I encourage you to engage your faith in sharing the rivers of living water. And if you're in this place and you are dying for a drink of that which would satisfy, to know the meaning of life, I have shared it with you today. It is the Lord Jesus Christ, him crucified, buried, and resurrected so that our sin and our past could hold us no more and our future would be inexpressibly bright. And even our community will tell the tale of what happened when Jesus meets brokenness, like ours, like the woman at the well. Would you pray with me? Come, Lord Jesus. Speak to us in such a way that we would find ourselves hopeful and excited for all that lies ahead and not lost in the, the excess of this life. Lord, we have so much and so much to be thankful for, but we have so much that distracts us from your purposes and your power in this life. May we not be owned by the things of this world, the great distractions, the religious structures, but may we be owned by that satisfying fount of life and purpose. May we taste the water that satisfies unto life eternal. In Jesus' name, amen. We often like to put Jesus at always being um, divine and, and apart from the human experience, but he wasn't. He was fully human. And there is a reality in the Christian faith that he knows what you and I thirst for because he experienced it. One of the last words Jesus Christ said before his spirit gave itself up and he died on the cross was this strange two-word phrase, I thirst. Have you ever noticed that? I thirst. When God inexplainably separated himself, God divided from God, when the Son of Man took on the sin of the world, Jesus Christ said, I thirst, because everything that was of the font, of the source, was parted from him, and the sin of the world was laid on him for one reason, that our past and our sin could be parted from us, and we could turn to the font and find new life. The reason Christ understands what it is to thirst is so that you can have a relationship with your Creator. You can have a relationship with the one who not only knows you by name, but sustains all things. Jesus Christ said the words, I thirst, so that you and I could finally be satisfied. So as you go from this place today, do not go here feeling free to keep it to yourself. Because just beyond the borders of this church is a world screaming, I thirst. What will you do to meet that invitation? If you're in this place and you thirst and you don't know Jesus Christ, don't hesitate. Come down right after church. We'll pray together. We'll pray together and you can invite Christ into your life. Because when Jesus said, I thirst, when Jesus said it, we know that for us a divine act happened. That we, if in him, if we called on him, would no longer have such a need. We would never thirst again. I invite you, as you work this out in your lives, to be faithful to the one who met the great answer to the question, who is Jesus? He is the one who quenches our thirst and gives us a sense of identity in a chaotic world. My friends, as you go from this place into the world, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In this crazy, mad world, may the peace of Christ be yours to carry forward into it. My friends, the church must leave the building because you are dismissed.